Hi there. We're going to have a very simple next half hour, I hope. Um, feeding the world is an incredibly complex problem. Um, we are going to move to uh, 9 billion people or 10 billion people or whatever it is. They all need to be fed. And not only need they, need they need to be fed, they also need to be sort of satisfied in their increasingly sophisticated choices for food. Um, and so can we, can we apply exponential technologies to this upcoming problem? Or maybe we already have that problem. In other words, do those six Ds that um, uh, Jeff introduced yesterday, can we apply them to food? It seems like it's a stretch. So in other words, can you actually digitize food? And you may think you cannot, but actually food is, if you decompose it into the chemical components that we need as humans, it's basically a couple of really essential components. It's like nine essential amino acids, one essential fatty acid, uh, and some vitamins and minerals that we um, cannot make ourselves. So if you decompose it into those categories, it's not very romantic, and you may not want it, but it can be done. Um, we also talked about the disruption, and nobody tells you where exactly in that curve we are. Um, I'm going to tell you for food, at least for part of the food, we're about three years away, where we get to that inflection point where things start to move much faster. Can you um, actually dematerialize food? Well, probably not, but you can move from, let's say, traditional cows, for instance, to a deconstructed type of material that you can produce anywhere without needing the cow. Um, and then, and I will talk about that. And then can you uh, demonetize? Of course you can, you can share, uh, and there's lots of sharing economies out there and that probably will increase, uh, whether that's the answer or not. Um, um, I'm not going to talk about, and can you democratize? Of course, you can produce food yourself. You can do that right now in a vegetable garden. Uh, it would be much harder for meat, but I will show you that in the future, you might actually be able to do that for meat as well. So, but you know, technically, a lot of things are possible. But we have to make choices, and it's a theme during the, these two days that is coming back all the time. Um, what choices are we going to make? Uh, you know, this is, this is how I look at, at food. It's, it's a production system, it's, uh, you know, we have a lot of jobs involved, it's a, it's a way of communicating with each other, um, socializing with each other, it's much more than just those couple of uh, chemicals. Um, but this is how some people in California look at food. This is completely decomposed, this is uh, a bottle of a bottle of with a liquid, uh, with all the essential um, stuff that you need to stay alive, um, and you can pick five of these bottles per day, and you can continue work on your computer. You don't have to socialize. You don't have to interrupt your work. None, none of all that sort of stuff, and you just can keep on working. And of course, they realized that food is at least to some degree social, so they came up with a way to share um, these fluids. But it's still not a, in my mind, a very desirable future. So, I don't know how about you, but um, I love meat. And um, that's a problem, because meat is a very, very expensive uh, component of our food. It's a nice component, but a lot of resources go into meat, and especially into beef, um, to produce it. For instance, currently we are using 70% of all our arable land to grow uh, livestock meat. And that's in the feed, that's in the grazing, it's not only cows, it's entire livestock. And according to the FAO, in 2050, meat consumption globally will have increased by 70%. Oops, and we just don't have enough planet to cover that. So there will be, if we don't do anything else, there will be a shortage of meat, just because we don't have the resources. Another externality of meat that is increasingly being discussed in the media, uh, in some countries more than in others, is that livestock contributes appreciably to greenhouse gas emissions. 
Now, this picture is actually wrong. A cow doesn't fart methane. It belches methane, but it comes out either way. And um, if we want to reduce greenhouse gas emission, we cannot really ignore the issue with livestock. Uh, finally, another scarce resource in some parts of this country, um, uh, pretty important, um, is water. For one kilo of beef, we require about 15,000 liters of fresh water. That's an astonishing amount of water. Um, and if you want to reduce that, you also have to come up with a solution. And you see that for pork and chicken, it's actually better. And for rice and legumes, it's, uh, it's even better. Why is that? Why is, is this so expensive? It's because a cow is a piece of technology that is old-fashioned and very, very inefficient in converting its food. It's here in the pink bar. In converting its food into, or its feed, into food for us. If at this day and age, you would start from scratch and you would develop a protein-producing system to feed the people, you would never come up with a cow. Right? It's incredibly inefficient. Pigs are more efficient, chicken are even more efficient, fish is very similar to plants. Now, of course, uh, there is a regionality to it. Um, you know this uh, Cebu cow. Uh, this typically Colombian. Um, in Colombia, you actually have a reasonably um, natural way of uh, breeding and, um, and husband, husbandry cow, um, because you have this, this land, that, and some of the land may not be used for something else. So, so in certain regions, it can be a very sensible thing to do, and especially in you know, Africa, where the cow is basically an insurance for a family and is eating stuff that no, nothing else is eating, um, it's fine. Uh, but the reality is that in other parts of the world, um, cows are being held in these very industrial-type systems, where they're completely dissociated from nature and from their natural food source. So what can we do? We can all become vegetarian. Now, who of you um, already knew all sort of the problems with meat production um, in terms of... Um, yes, raise your hand. So it's, it's a pretty much everybody, right? Well, more than 50%. So now the difficult question. Who of you is vegetarian? Right. Note, I didn't raise my hand. I'm not a vegetarian. I'm basically a very flawed and sinful person. Um, but the fact of the matter is, it apparently, although we all know these issues, it's apparently very difficult to change our behavior because it's such a nice food. It's such, so delicious, so nutritious. We grew up with it. It's part of our system. And it's even worse because you know, globally, it's going to be different. This is the human trophic level. It's kind of an artificial statistic. It's where we are in the food chain. It's one for a plant, it's two for an animal that eats plants, and it's three for an animal that eats animals that eats plants. So we are at 2.35, meaning that 35% of our calories come from animals that eat plants. And look at the bottom graph. This is the track that India and China have followed over the last 30 years. They're gradually creeping up to that same number. Um, and why is that, and it has been shown before, is that that, that, st that statistic, that human trophic level, where we're in the food chain, or in other words, how much meat we eat, is linearly related to the gross domestic product of a country. So as soon as people become rich, and the number of uh, middle-class incomes rise, they start to eat meat. It's weird, but this is what is happening. Even in uh, Colombia, meat production is rising. And there are probably a lot of explanations for it, but, um, you know, it's rising. And that, that makes sense, because the demand is going to increase. But with the rise comes these externalities. So in 2004, I met this guy, Willem van Eelen, and at that time he was already 86. And he was obsessed most of his life with the idea of creating meat in a different way. From tissue that you take from a cow and then transfer into a laboratory and make meat. 
that in his mind was mostly a problem for animal welfare issues in livestock, but um, also could reduce greenhouse gas emission and um, food security issues. So we picked up on this and we said, well, you know, let's try and do this. Um, the idea is actually very old. Winston Churchill in 1932 already came up with that idea. But at that time, the technology was really not there yet. So what do we do? We take a um, needle biopsy from a cow. Actually, Raymond uh, told about you this uh, yesterday, how he told the story to his kids with a pig. Doesn't matter, same thing. Um, we take a, a little puncture from a cow. We take a small sample of muscle. Uh, it's one centimeter long, one millimeter in diameter. And this has a couple of hundred stem cells. And stem cells are cells that are basically sort of the regenerative capacity of our body. So you probably know of stem cells as embryonic stem cells that basically can produce an entire organism. What most of you probably don't know is that every organ and every tissue in our body has stem cells. They are much more dedicated, uh, but they are sitting there waiting to repair tissue when it's injured. And our muscle are chock full of these stem cells. And when your muscle is injured, they come in, they start to divide, and they start to form muscle tissue. It's an amazing, effective system. They can do that inside of your body, but interestingly enough, they can also do that outside of your body. So what we do is we take that sample, we take those stem cells out, and let them proliferate. To an extent that from that small piece of muscle, we can make thousands of kilos of beef thereby being able to reduce the number of cows tremendously. Now, of course, these are cells. Um, you know, they are not as nice as the um, fritanga that I showed you earlier. Um, <coughs> so how do you make a fritanga of it, of at least beef? I'm not claiming to be able to make fritanga yet. Um, how do you make beef? So first of all, the cells need to start making a tissue or forming sort of the first step of making a tissue, and that is actually merging. So the, the, the cells have to merge into a long fiber, which is the primitive muscle fiber. And the instruction in the lab to do that is very simple. We starve them. Once you starve them, start to merge. And then the next thing is that you need to make a tissue. This is a little bit more complex. Um, we basically put the cells here on, in, in the left panel, the cells in a gel, and a gel is pretty specific, uh, that allows the cells to find each other, uh, to hook up to each other, and to form a tissue. And because it's in a ring structure, and because surprisingly, um, the muscles actually start to contract in a Petri dish. Ladies and gentlemen, I, I'm breaking the news to you, our muscle cells are exercise junkies. Our brains are not, but these are not connected to brains. So they start to contract, and because they're in a ring structure, um, that contraction leads to tension. And all of you who go to the gym and lift weights, you know that that tension actually is the biggest trigger for getting thick muscle. So it takes about three weeks, and then we get a muscle fiber that under the microscope looks exactly the same as the muscle fiber from the original steak that we took it from. So we presented this in London in 2013 in a hybrid between a cooking show and a press conference where this hamburger, which actually cost us $300,000 to make, um, uh, where it was cooked by a very courageous chef, of course. He did, fortunately, he didn't burn it. Um, and it was eaten by two food critics, and they said, oh yeah, this is a hamburger. It's a little bit expensive, uh, and there was no fat tissue, so it was not as juicy and as uh, tasteful yet as it should be. Uh, but yeah, it's a hamburger. So this for us was proof of concept. Yes, you can do this. Um, you probably need to reduce the price, but you can do it. It was to show the world, you know, the technology is basically here. Let's try and think about this. So how do you go from there to a product? Of course, you have to make it efficient. You have to make sure that that food conversion that's horrible in a cow is much better in this system. Uh, you have to make sure that everything that you do is, is sustainable. And you have a lot of variables to play with. 
Um, you can work with the culture conditions. You have everything basically under control. So one of the things is, of course, uh, scaling up. And I'm not going through all the sort of science behind this because uh, you know, it would take me an hour and a half. Um, but for scaling up, uh, we came up with uh, just a very simple system where in a tank, basically a big fermenter tank, and it can be a thousand liters or 25,000 liters, you grow these cells on microcarriers, the little pink balls here, and the blue dots are actually the cells. And this can be scaled from lab scale to a very, very large industrial scale. And actually, those tanks already exist in the industry. So you can just adopt the system that is already there. So this is sort of a schematic. You go from a very large, small scale to a very large um, scale in this uh, process. <clears throat> now, it also needs to be sustainable, which is really important for me, meaning that every component in that cultured meat, as I call it, is of unlimited supply, either because it's really unlimited or because we can make it unlimited through recycling. And two of the components that were in that 2013 hamburger were actually not of limited supply. They still came from cows, which was the serum, um, which is in sort of an, uh, a component in the feed of the cells that allow them to grow, and the gel, the gel that allows the cells to form a tissue that was also still animal-derived. So um, we needed to get rid of that. Um, we also had to change a couple of other cell culture conditions, like we are growing cells in the absence of antibiotics, because, of course, we want to get rid of, in one sweep, of the antibiotics as well. Um, and we want to grow the cells uh, without this blood component. And we can do that. Um, currently, we are able to do that, and the next version will have none of that blood system, and actually also will, will not have anything of that collagen. So it's all, all animal product free, except for those cells that you take from the cow. Um, I mentioned that that 2013 hamburger didn't have any fat tissue, and this is basically, uh, this is a medical technology. Uh, tissue engineering of muscle is a medical technology. And as you can imagine, in the medical field, there was not a lot of incentive to grow fat tissue, right? We have abundance of fat tissue. So we had to redesign that ourselves. We can actually use the same stem cells and coerce them to become fat cells by using naturally occurring fatty acids. So technologically, this is all possible. And we are moving towards the scale, and I will show you that we actually also are moving towards reducing that price so that this can become available. But then another interesting thing happened in 2013 when we presented that hamburger. And that is that the popular press said, yuck. They clearly didn't like it. And they actually came up with a Frankenstein burger and things like that. Which is interesting. It's an emotional response. Um, and I was frustrated, not because of the response, but because I didn't quite understand what was behind the response. And I want to understand that. And one of my, my dilemmas, I, you know, I can see this is new, I can see this is weird, and I can, uh, but, you know, uh, I can also see that rationally it's a pretty good idea. So, and one of my dilemmas was uh, the hot dog. Now, Raymond asked you yesterday, who of you is familiar with the hot dog, who of you actually has eaten them? Really? Quite a few. Do you know what's in it? You do? Okay, you're out. <laughs> um, the thing is, a lot of people don't know what's in it or how it's being made. And if I really ask them, they say, well, please don't tell me, because I'm afraid I won't like the answer. So we are perfectly capable of eating stuff that we don't know how it's made or what's in it. So how is that different for that, for, for that hamburger? And I think one of the reasons is that, um, you know, a hot dog, you've seen a lot of people eat this, and they stay alive, right? We are biologically programmed not to eat stuff that we don't know. If you go into the forest and you, you find mushrooms and you cook a meal with those mushrooms and you don't know what you're doing, chances are that you're going to poison yourself. 
So we are programmed not to eat stuff that we don't know. And that all has to do with safety and trust in a product like this. So for that, you need early adopters. We have enough early adopters, and we need to have storytelling to uh, make sure that everybody understands that this is safe. And of course, we need to have regulation. So in, in every country, in every continent, there are regulatory offices um, dealing with these issues all the time. And once it can only be entered the market if they approve it, and if you have enough evidence that this is safe. The second thing is, uh, this is, by the way, a microbrewery in uh, Bogota. The second is that we want to have the illusion, and I specifically say illusion, of control over how our food is being produced. So if this is a cow, one and a half million years of evolution in nature, checks and balances, you can mess with it a little bit. A little bit. There is a limit to it. Um, and now you convert that into something that is made by people. And people are fraudulent, they make mistakes, they are money-driven, and God knows what they are going to do with our meat. Um, and it may be sort of in a faraway country. This is a classical example of confusing the technology itself with how it's being implemented in society. Right? So we came up with the story, well, what if you have in the middle of Bogota a couple of animals, a petting zoo, with uh, three cows, three chicken, three pi uh, pigs, um, and the, ki the children of the primary schools go there, they pet them, they give them names, they feed them. Uh, once in a while, you poke them in the butt. And in a barn next to the farm, you grow meat for the entire community. And this is like a microbrewery. Then you would have full control. You can visit that on Sunday, you can order your meal, you can order your, your meat, uh, and you can pick it up there. And it can be somewhat artisanal. Um, so that is, a, is another story where, with another implementation of the technology that may be much more acceptable than sort of the, the vision of large um, factories in multinationals. And this is, um, I don't know, this seems to be a Colombian thing to... Um, I've never seen this before, uh, <laughs> but you probably have. Um, and wh why am I showing this? Um, I'm showing this because meat is, is a culture. It's part of our culture. Um, we have in the Netherlands, I, I kid you not, we have a commercial running now for barbecue sauce. And it's Sylvester Stallone with a machine gun killing half a dozen of people. Um, and there is this wimpy Dutch actor following in his trail, and, and, and then they have lunch at the set. And, and really, um, Sylvester Stallone says to the, to the guy, if you want to fight like a man, you have to eat like a man. And he puts this big plate of steaks in front of the actor, and then the barbecue sauce, of course, comes in. So it's, it's a culture, it's, it's masculinity, it's power, it's fire, it's supremacy over other species. And you may not realize that if you walk into the supermarket and you buy this little red stuff from a plastic container, but it's still somewhere in our minds. And if you now you know, start making that in the lab without all the risks of the cowboys and the fire and the hunting and all that stuff, it becomes something else. Even if, if chemically and biochemically it's exactly the same, from a cultural perspective, it becomes something else. It becomes more like a broccoli. And that, of course, is something, a change that we all have to go through. I look at our food system, and I may be wrong, but I, you know, I'm, I'm looking at it that we are going more and more towards a plant-based diet. It's good for our health, it's good for the planet, um, and it's, of course, also good for animals, although there will be much less. So this is a product that actually ease that transition towards a plant-based diet, because from a cultural perspective, it's something else. It might also be a little bit harder sell. <clears throat> Once you have accepted this idea of that you can make meat in a lab or in a factory, uh, and you have the production fully under control, you can start to think, well, maybe I can make this hamburger healthier. Make, maybe I can coerce these fat cells that we are making from those stem cells. Maybe I can coerce them to make um, polyunsaturated fatty acids, omega-3 fatty acids, so that your cholesterol actually goes down instead of going up. And you would have a prescription from the doctor to go twice a week to McDonald's to get your hamburger. 
This is our gift to McDonald's. They don't realize it yet, but uh, you know, whatever. <coughs> so about the price. Um, this is a medical technology. Those first, the first hamburger was really, really expensive, and it was handmade, and you know, in, a, in an environment that was not really cost effective, and not even looking at cost. So how do you go to a, let's say, you know, a one dollar hamburger? When one dollar is a little bit uh, much in our view still, but um, you know, in three years we think we have this at sort of eleven dollars per hamburger, which is still a lot. But it's okay for restaurants and for specialty stores. How do we get there? This is a single step, just scaling up. That's the only thing we need to do to get from the 330,000 to uh, 11. How do you get from 11 to 1? It's mostly in the feed of those cells. How are you going to source? How are you going to source them from cheaper sources than we currently? Have. So, for instance, if I buy half a, half a liter of feed for those cells right now, I pay about $10. If I make it myself from exactly the same ingredients that I also buy, it's 25 cents. So, there is a tremendous uh, gain to be had in this uh, price reduction. Now, the scary thing was that up till two years ago, I was the only one in the world doing this. And having done this for about six, seven years, and being still the only one, it, you kind of feel awkward. You know, am I missing something? Why is why are people not picking this up? And perhaps my greatest satisfaction in the last year, half year, is that right now there are 30 startup companies working on this. There's this website of uh, Olivia Cabana, and she keeps track of all the. This is not only cultured meat, this is also alternative proteins, vegetable proteins, and things like that. Um, so let's zoom in on the, um, on the meat section, and you see it's a poultry, and it's pork, and it's seafood, um, and it's beef, but there are now 30 companies, and the estimation is that half a year from now there are 50 more startups. And what's even more is that these startups are now being supported financially by venture capital um, and also by the large meat industry. So the, the Tysons and the Cargills of this world are actually investing in this. So that for me is a sign you know, that there is sort of a point of no return. This is going to happen. The question is a little bit how quick. Three years from now in restaurants, we can be pretty sure of that. Um, Supermarkets going down to that one dollar per um, per hamburger. A couple of years later, I cannot really give a time on that, but um, this is going to happen. So my my ideal future seems very very simple. It's keep on doing what we love doing, eating meat, not feeling bad about it, not having to think about all the externalities of livestock meat production and use food as a as we always have done it as a way to socialize and um, keep the sort of gentle atmosphere uh, among people uh, in this world uh, and with that i would like to uh, end and i thank you very much for your attention